Remember, developing a brand strategy in a crisis involves conducting a thorough analysis of the situation. You also need to identify key stakeholders. You want to make sure you're developing key messages and creating a plan for communicating with your employees, you know, with your customers, your clients, you know, and the other stakeholders as well. Welcome to Strategy with Dr. M. Stollard. This series is entitled Your Brand Strategy in a Crisis. This is episode number 10. And I think I'm just going to do maybe two more episodes on this subject matter. Um, and then maybe, you know, we'll come back to it at some point in time. But um, I think that's going to be um, it. That's the goal. So, yeah, that's the goal. Um, 12 episodes. So make sure to be mindful in your tone and your messaging, you know, and avoid anything that may come across as insensitive or opportunistic. Right. Remember, it's a crisis, not just for yourself, but sometimes your clients and your customers are also affected by it. So a brand strategy crisis can be a challenging time for any organization or brand itself, as it can, you know, it's going to quickly damage the reputation of the organization. It could lead to a significant loss of customer trust or client trust, you know, and in a scenario, you know, it's essential to make sure you're responding appropriately, you know, without being insensitive or opportunistic, right? Um, and that's important. I kind of said that already, but I just kind of want to reiterate that, right? You don't want to be insensitive or opportunistic. So there's a few things you want to make sure that you are doing when it comes to the tone of your message. First thing is to be empathetic, right? First step, be empathetic towards handling a brand crisis, you know? And so that means to empathize with those who are affected, especially if it's your fault, <laughs> right? Especially if it's your company's fault. You want to make sure you're being empathetic with your customers, with your clients, and so forth. And then your staff members as well. You as in the leadership role want to make sure that you are also being empathetic to the people who are work for you, right? So you want to acknowledge the issue. You want to express your concern and support for those that are impacted, right? And for those that may have been, you know, impacted by if it's directly related to what your organization has done, you know, um, whether it was intentional or unintentional. So that's our topic for today. Organizations and those that want to create social impact. And we do this through strategy. So first thing you want to do is be transparent, right? Transparency is a critical when it comes to a brand crisis. You want to be open and honest about whatever the situation may be presented itself. Um, you want to make sure you provide regular and consistent updates, you know, to keep your people that in the know, people that who need to know in the know, right? So that's like your stakeholders, your clients, and so forth. And when I say stakeholders, you know, your customers, your clients, and then the people who actually work for you, right? And that's the one thing we sometimes tend to forget that the people that work for you are also directly affected when a brand crisis takes place. So again, um, next, you want to make sure you stay true to your values, right? We talked about that before in a little bit deeper, but your brand values should guide your response um, to a crisis. You know, stick to your principles and ensure that your actions and whatever you're doing align directly with your brand's identity, with your brand's organizations, your mission, your vision, um, not just your short-term vision, too, which is obviously to get, get through the crisis, but your long-term vision as well. And make sure you check one of my previous episodes because I get into that pretty detailed as far as what it should look like from a long-term um, from a long-term vision standpoint, right? Um, something that's also very important that I want to make sure you bring to your attention is that you want to avoid what's called, what I would call like tone deaf messaging, right? Avoid tone deaf messaging. You want to make sure that the messaging that you're giving to your client, your audience is appropriate, you know, and make sure that it's actually sensitive to the situation, right? You don't want to come off like you're blowing off like that you don't care, right? Or that you're literally sleeping on a canopy, um, you know, having a lemonade and so forth while everybody else is potentially suffering, you know? So you want to avoid using language or visuals that can be perceived as you don't care, right? <laughs> or inappropriate. You know, you want to make sure that you have a diverse set of individuals that are on your brand strategy team in order to, when you get ready to prepare your messaging, you it is investigated thor thoroughly, right? And the words you're choosing to say are words that are going to be, um, that are going to be impactful, right? Um, but you don't want to come off as accusatory. You don't want to shift the blame, 
you know, and you don't want to be quote unquote loud, right? Like, no, look at me. It's not my fault, <laughs> right? That's not what you want to come off, right? You want to make sure that you're being empathetic. And again, you don't want to come off accusatory. And then the way you do that, one of the ways you do it is you make sure you have a diverse brand strategy of your team, right? And sometimes people may know that or think they know that, but really you want to make, you know, one of the things you want to make sure is that when you talk about your brand strategy team, you have a diverse people that's male, that's females, right? Um, and everything in between, right? So don't exploit the crisis, right? That's the next thing. Don't exploit the crisis. Your brand may not survive it, right? And I'll say that again. You don't want to exploit the crisis. Don't use it as just an opportunity to make money. A brand crisis is not an opportunity for you just to promote your brand or your products, right? Um, especially if, now let's say it like this. If your brand organization can be impactful, can be helpful to other people, then there's a way to kind of present what's going on, present how you can help without seem like you're coming off opportunistic, like I was saying earlier. One of the things I remember, I can't remember the name of the company, though. It was a, it was a company that made um, alcohol, right? And this was during the pandemic. And one of the things they did is that instead of making alcohol, they have, and I'm not big on alcohol, I don't know how the thing works, but you have like your factory, your distillery that makes the alcohol. So let's say they had 10 things, 10 distillery uh, pumps that make the alcohol, right? Or 10 sectors. Um, what they did is they shut down like half of those and used half of those to continue to make alcohol like they normally would, but in a slower amount, right? But then they used the other half to actually make hand sanitizer, right? And that was, and they kept that at an affordable price so that people could actually get hand sanitizer without feeling like you had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for a small little bit of bottles, right? And that's one of the things they did. And that was a way to um, help in the middle of the pandemic, let people know that you care, you know, and at the same time being empathetic without uh, being opportunistic. And they probably did make some money. You know, but it doesn't have that quote unquote icky feeling, you know. So if the brand crisis is, you know, industry related or better yet, um, industry that you are not necessarily in, you can, especially if there's a lot of chaos, simply make yourself available to those who are in need. And that's kind of what that company did. You know, you can you tell a story that's related to the situation at hand, explain how you and your team, you know, maybe were able to be there for someone else you know, that helps someone else get to success, you know, or another organization. But don't make it about your brand. Make it about the people that you actually have served. And that's the key. You know, of, again, avoid using the situation just to self-promote or advertise merely. Um, and remember, you're, you're merely a guy. You're just a guy trying to help people. So, again, as we move on with that, uh, when it comes to a brand crisis, you know, especially if it's your fault, make sure you take responsibility. Make sure you take responsibility. So for so far, we've talked about being transparent, excuse me, being empathetic. Then make sure you're being transparent, right? You want to stay true to your values. You want to avoid tone deaf messaging, right? You know, when you're being transparent, I think I said this already, but just in case, make sure you're open and honest about the situation. You know, provide regular consistent updates to keep everyone informed, right? So be empathetic, be transparent, stay true to your values, you know, avoid tone deaf messaging, right? Don't exploit the crisis, right? Don't exploit the crisis. And the next thing you want to make sure you do is take responsibility, especially if it's your fault. If if your brand is at fault, take responsibility. Offer a sincere apology. There's a whole lot of back and forth on whether um, organizations should apologize to customers and so forth. Um, my thing, and I've worked for companies that did one side, I worked for companies that did the other side. And what I would tell you in a true brand crisis, um, if you can be sincere, then yes, apologize, right? Because you're apologizing, not necessarily that you made a mistake. We all make mistakes. I mean, you can apologize for making a mistake, but you want to apologize on basically what that mistake may have caused, cost. And that's the ability of true empathizing, right? What kind of situation have you are now people are now in based on the mistakes that you may have made, right? Um, so be accountable for your actions, you know, and take steps. Like I was saying, be accountable for your actions. Take steps to prevent similar incidents from happening again in the future. And that's why I talked about in our previous episodes. You want to make sure it's not just short-term fixes, but long-term fixes, right? You know, your brand, um, being an agent 
um, for a solution uh, is a necessary part of the brand strategy. You know, your brand being an agent for a solution or an agent that's, or an agent solution um, is definitely part of a brand strategy. And that's what you want to make sure that you're positioning yourself. The next thing you want to do is listen to feedback, right? You will get a lot of it, right? Listen to feedback from your customers, stakeholders, you know, the public, and it's okay. Don't get into the thing of like, well, I already know everything. Well, if you knew everything, you probably wouldn't be in this brand crisis to begin with. But it's okay. Sometimes you just got to take it, even if it's bad advice, <laughs> even if it's bad feedback, right? Take it. So they're concerned seriously. Um, take their concerns seriously. Use their feedback to improve on your situation, to improve your response, you know, to prevent future crises. Sometimes using some of the words and the tones that they're using back to the, your customers and clients when you create that response for them, you know, um, helps them to feel like they've really been heard, right? They've really been heard. So people want to be feel heard, they want to be seen, right? And um, you want to make sure that you're doing that when you are, you know, you want to make sure you're doing that when you are uh, receiving that feedback and then quote unquote, creating your messaging uh, on behalf of that. So let me ex allow me to explain a little bit more on this area. So and before I do, I want to share a little bit about my background. It's not to brag, but just to let you know that this is an area where I've kind of stated a little extensively, right? We're talking about feedback. You know, part of gathering usable feedback comes from collecting and interpreting gathered data from individuals, right? And this data comes from, it could be old school on the phone, it could be social media sites, right? Which is right now is the most popular place to kind of get um, information and get data from people. When I'm saying data, how do people feel about a certain product or service? How do people feel about what's going on, right? Uh, Twitter was a great resource for that at one point in time. Now it's gotten through some changes. So I'm not saying it's a bad resource. I'm just saying right now it's going through some changes, you know? Um, but there's still plenty of other sites out there, right? So, you know, in-person surveys is another way to kind of gather and interpret data from individuals, you know, any place where an individual can give their opinion and feedback can be collected, that's kind of where you want to be. You know, in this term, what we're talking about is really, it's called sentiment analysis, right? Sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is basically the act of identifying and evaluating, identifying and evaluating, you know, authentic human thoughts and opinions. And that's the most important part. Authentic means what do the humans, what do us as humans as individuals truly believe about what we're saying about a product or service, you know? And, it, and this is, and this is, and it's, you when these thoughts and opinions are being expressed, it's always about a business, about an organization, about maybe their products, their services, or a company as a whole, right? So it's the act of identifying and evaluating authentic human thoughts and opinions that are expressed about a business, organization, about their products, services, their company as a whole. You know, how are people feeling about these things? And the most important part is authentic. You know, sometimes we use, um, tools and so forth to kind of help with that. And that can make it a little challenging. But if you understand what people are truly mean, meaning you have to be able to get past the slang, you know, that you may not necessarily understand, get past a certain terminology, right? And then you'll be able to kind of move forward with that. So this is a specific area where I conducted extensive research. This is full disclosure. You know, if you can look it up, my research is entitled Business Intelligence, the Influence of Sentiment Analysis on Small Businesses, right? Um, I'm Dr. Hempstall because... You know, that's when I got my doctoral degree. I have a doctor of business administration with a specialization in business intelligence. And so business intelligence is basically using information from various different departments and arenas to, to make the best business decision, right? So in short, my research revealed that the use of tools and other applications help to improve the accuracy of the feedback that was collected. And sometimes there's so much data, you're not even sure uh, what's good data, what's bad data. In-person data is always the best, but the challenge with that is becomes that it's, you can't always get gather a large amount of, of data, right? It comes in small bits of time. And then some of the challenges also when you use certain tools that some of the tools are not always as accurate. But what I can tell you based on my research is that tools are improving. The tools are definitely improving and they're getting better. So, um, you know, gathering and analyzing customer feedback, you know, can provide valuable insights into how your brand, your organization is actually perceived, especially during the crisis. You know, by monitoring customer feedback, you can identify Areas where your brand strategy may need to improve, you know, and develop strategies in 
what are actually the most pressing concerns of customers, meaning it may not even be an area that you are considering or thinking about. You know, you're thinking about A, B, C, and D because it's the obvious choice and it makes sense, but really they're talking about D, E, and F, you know, and so sometimes these tools and so forth can help you with that, right? So when developing a brand strategy in a crisis, data and analytics can play a crucial role in making informed decisions. So talk to someone in your marketing team, you can talk to someone in your computer science team, talk to us, right? You know, here's some, there are some data analytics that can quickly help develop a brand strategy in a crisis. So, so the next part is social media monitoring, right? Social media monitoring. So in a crisis, social media platforms can be a powerful tool for monitoring and responding to customer feedback, right? Social media analytics, can give you an insight into customer sentiment, which we'll be kind of finished talking about, but I'm going a little bit deeper. Trending topics, right? And, you know, competitor activity, understanding co competitor activity in real time, right? It's not just about listening to feedback, but taking a little bit uh, deeper where you're talking about you're monitoring it. So you're not just waiting for somebody to come back and respond to you. You're not waiting for a survey to come back, but you're actually trying to listen in real time. So social media analytics can give you insights into, like I said, customer sentiment, trending topics, um, you know, competitor activity, right? Uh, those who are not your competitors, right? People who are up and coming, maybe, you know, that could be that could be your competition at some point in time. So, you know, I like to be careful when I make recommendations, right, um, across the board. But, you know, just to get you a little insight, get you pointed in the right direction, you want to look at companies like Sprout Social, you know, Hootsuite. You know, I've used both of these personally, you know, and um, and you're going to need more than just standard level packaging to kind of get to the sentiment analysis part, right? You want to make sure that you have the level that has the sentiment component to it or the sentiment analysis component to it. It's a term, it's a phrase, it's becoming more popular, right? And so if you can jump ahead of that game, you know, one of my things I've noticed in my research is that that particular term is not so much popular, you know, sometimes people were using it anyway. They just didn't necessarily know. So if you can be ahead of it and you start to use it knowingly, getting some of these tools, you're going to be in a lot better position, right? So sentiment analysis, customer sentiment. So these are some of the terms under, you know, the business intelligence umbrella, right? But more focused. So these components are sometimes add-ons, right? To these different software packages, these different tools, you know, to help you to get your real-time data for small, medium, and medium-sized businesses. You know, if you're an Amazon-sized company, you may... Um, or you could get a, like a more high-end software tool, right? You even develop your own. Um, let's see, website traffic. Analyzing website traffic can provide valuable insights into customer behavior during the crisis. You know, by monitoring a web traffic or website traffic. So when you're, we're talking about website traffic, right? So by monitoring website traffic, you can identify which pages are the most popular, right? So in the middle of a crisis, maybe it's, a certain page that gives you the most attention, like your sales page or your order page or your checkout page. But when you find out in the middle of a crisis, maybe it's the contact information. Maybe it's the contact page, right? Um, or it's a particular tool. If you sell a product, maybe it's a particular tool that you think that, you know, you, you're using it for this, but actually it's something else. You know, I'll, I'll tell you that like hockey ski masks were super popular, right? Um, winter masks, like, you know, to be able to cover their faces during the pandemic were extremely popular, even though it wasn't wintertime, right? Extremely popular. People were just trying to get something to cover their mouth with, masks, all kinds of masks. You know, masks that you use to like sneeze, ski, and protect your mouth from breathing cold air and so forth, those were hard to find, right? So by monitoring web traffic, right, to your particular web pages, your sites, and so forth, and this is something, again, your marketing team or your computer science team can actually help you with, or your business intelligence team, right? You know, you'll be able to determine which products and services are in high demand, which pages are driving the most conversions, you know, which products are driving the most conversions, right? And, you know, which pages are getting the most attention. So in the middle of a brand crisis, it should be your home base page, right? It should be, right? The page I mentioned before uh, that has the information for everyone that has the most common questions, right? So whenever you're in the middle of a crisis, one of the things I talked about was just you had to have a, a particular page um, at your home base, your home base for, for like the FAQs of everything that's possibly happening that you can have that's external to your clients and customers, right? 
So um, some other tools, this is some high-end tools. So I know I mentioned so Sprout Social and Hootsuite. I don't have any, um, what, what is it? Uh, special packages or affiliation with them. But Brand24, the one that I've used, um, it's a pretty good package for a real-time listening, brand, a brand watch, you know, or some other tools, you know. Some other things, um, sales analytical data, right? Sales data can help you understand how this price is affecting your business, right? You need this in real-time information, you know? And so part of the crisis can be the fact that you hadn't had any sales in three months, you know? And so sales data is going to tell you why. What was your most last item that was the most popular that um, is no longer getting the attention? Why is that? Is it simply that you ran out? Or is it some other reason? Something going on in the industry, locally or global, right? You need this real-time information. You know, I'm not the finance expert, uh, but you definitely have to be willing to work with that team. Your finance team, your accounting team, someone who works in that department should be able to speak to this in real time. You know, analyzing sales data, you know, can provide insights into which products or services are impacted, right? Which customer segments are most affected and which regions are experiencing the most significant decline in sales, right? Competitor analysis. Conducting competitor analysis can help you understand how your competitors are responding in this crisis. By analyzing their messaging, right, advertising, the social media activity, right, you can identify opportunities, right, maybe a gap in their marketing plan, you know, opportunities to differentiate your brand and develop a competitive advantage, you know, take a look at, understand the consumer behavior from the people that they serve, right, is there an opportunity for you, for you to uh, serve those people, right, and so, Data analytics can provide valuable insight into customer behavior. And that's the, my whole point of this whole thing. You know, sentiment, competitor activity, um, you know, during a crisis is so important to get that information in real time. You know, when you monitor and analyze that data, you know, you can develop a brand strategy a whole lot quicker that addresses the true customer's concerns, you know, and continue to maintain their trust, you know, and it keeps you it keeps your brand competitive. It keeps your organization competitive. You know, so again, remember to utilize that data and analytics so you can quickly help and develop a brand strategy to inform your to inform your team, you know, so that you can create a good and effective plan of action, you know, especially to those who need to know. So handling brand strategy in a crisis, in a brand crisis requires empathy, requires transparency, requires commitment to your brand values, right? Uh, but you have to be able to get information in real time, right? So in order to be able to be truly empathetic and truly transparent and truly committed, you know, in a, in, a, in real time, you want to make sure that you are using the analytical tools that are available to you, you know? So again, avoid being insensitive or opportunistic behavior. And the good thing is that the terms that you want to use, the messaging you want to use sometimes come from the customers, comes from the clients, comes from how they're talking out, out in, the, in the social media, in the real world. And you can use some of those terms and also to be able to explain to your customers what's going on or to redirect and say, it's not quite like this, but maybe it's like this, right? So avoid being insensitive or opportunistic during that particular time, but definitely position yourself as an organization that's available to help, right? You know, you'll be able to better navigate the brand crisis. You'll be able to emerge stronger as a brand, you know, and um, that's it. <laughs> that's all we have for you today. So I am Dr. M. Stoller, and I need to remember to keep pushing forward to drive your influence and be intentional by using strategy.